Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to punch, chop, and kick your way through the greatest era of action movies. That is, of course, 1975 to 1995. And it has been four months <laughs> since I've said that, maybe longer. <laughs> and I, I, somehow I still remembered it. I forgot my order. I was like, do I go after John or before John? <laughs> Sitting here panicked. Oh no, wait a minute. I forgot what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> we have been preparing for season three for exactly two weeks. I know there's been a long pause. <laughs> <It's only> three <laughs> weeks. Give us some credit. Three weeks. I will say that if you didn't listen to our last episode, which is our behind the scenes planning meeting, where I talked about the movies that we chose and why we chose them, what the break was all about, and then hundreds and hundreds of other recommendations on things to check out. <laughs> I highly suggest you go back and give that one a listen. Short version of that is season three is all about unlikely duos. A little bit about a cop, not escort someone, escort a witness to a trial. We're talking about true partners and trying to solve something. And there was absolutely no way we do not start this season on unlikely duos with the ultimate duo. Now, I know there's Tubbs and Crockett. I mean, they are the ultimate <laughs> duo. <laughs> but let's be honest here. The, the duo that everything is measured against is Kurt Russell and Sylvester Stallone in the classic Tango and Cash. It, what's great about it, too, is that this is literally the only movie that they ever were in together. This is very much odd couple because we never really got a second Tango and Cash pairing. Well... <laughs> I think that there's rumors that Sylvester tried to get it up again, like about a couple of years ago, and Kurt Russell shot it down and said, absolutely not. So there's oh, that. You know, <laughs> I'm sorry. I will correct myself. I do believe, didn't he make an appearance, Kurt, make an appearance in one of the Expendables? No, he did not. Okay. He did okay, not so want yeah. to be in that. <laughs> he refused to be in it. He was asked and said, no, that was That's not something right. he wanted to do. <laughs> He was well, supposed to be Mr. Church, and then they, they he said no, and they had to go with Buck so, Buck. Yes. <laughs> I have a little bit of information about that. So this movie premiered, and a lot of people refer to this as the final action 80s action movie of the decade. And they'd be right, because it premiered on December 22nd, 1989. So it was the last one. <laughs> <laughs> There's not much room for other movies to come out after that one. It may not be the best, but it was the last. <laughs> It was directed by Andre Koncho. <laughs> Let's go. Come on. You can do it. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. Yeah, you, yeah, don't worry. I'm going to have a much harder name later. So <laughs> He's credited on the movie. His name shows on the credits, too, when you watch it. Like the, la the first name is shown at the end of the movie that you see that it's his film. But he was fired before he could finish the movie by the producers. Another guy named Albert Magnoli stepped in. He really only did two scenes. One earlier in the movie, which I'm drawing a blank on, and the final scene with the suburban and then the graders and stuff. Because basically, Conchavot Andre... Andre. <laughs> <laughs> said that the he didn't want the movie to be silly. And the producers kind of wanted the movie to be a little silly, like a parody of an 80s action movie. And he refused to do it, which is why also it's very clear that the ending is very different from the rest of the movie. It's mm. a different director on there. But I'm going to throw both those people out because the real director on this movie and the real reason why Andre left, and according to Brian James, who had said in an interview later, is that Sly essentially took over. He wrote, rewrote some of the script. He was doing directing on set. He was adjusting how scenes were being filmed. He was kind of in the way. He was taking over. <laughs> is that why there are so many puns? <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe on the writing. I'll give you on the writing. It's written by Randy Feldman and Jeffrey Bohm. Jeffrey Bohm wrote the screenplays for Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, Lethal Weapon 2 and 3, The Lost Voice, Ooh. Bunny mm. Farm, Ooh. and, I mean, listen, this is a movie about faces, right? Yeah. Sly and Kurt, Brian James, Robert Zadar, is, this movie's got the faces, and he worked with the ultimate face, the chin. <laughs> he worked with the none other than my hero, Bruce Campbell. <laughs> He co-created and wrote for The Adventures of Frisco County Jr. Oh, nice. So you put all these things together and we get this classic. 
right? But it's a uh, based on how the production was, it's a miracle it got made. And that might say some things about why Kurt Russell was like, I'm not working with Sylvester Stallone ever again. Yeah, because if he took over everything, <laughs> and not only that, but why does Sylvester Stallone get top billing? He's top bill he gets top billing and everything. He's it's him first, they show his name first. Weren't they like they were they were very much like well re- I mean, come on. <laughs> I I guess they might have offered the role of cash to Patrick Swayze, but he <gasps> turned it down. Oh my god. Um, so they had to go with Kurt Russell. That might why did you be tell why me that? Stone <laughs> got top billing. I don't know. Um, oh my but, god. I, now I can, all I can do is think about Patrick Swayze being in that role. Well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> there it was, was a better it was, version in here. Wait, wait. There was a better version in here where it was Kurt Russell and Patrick Swayze. <gasps> all that hair together. <laughs> so, no, the reason Patrick Swayze couldn't do the movie was because of Roadhouse. Oh, thank God. Okay. okay. <laughs> Good thing Roadhouse still got made. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yes. I need my Roadhouse. Yes. Like now so. I want to go find that and see if there's somewhere where I can watch so, that yeah. this weekend. <laughs> you 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 could have either you could have gotten Sly Sly and Patrick, but no Roadhouse or Kurt and Sly in Roadhouse. So I'm just saying. <laughs> Listen, I, I think we lucked out. I think we did. Yes. Listen, if Melissa's got about an hour and 45 minutes of time available, she's going to do one of two things. She's going to watch Roadhouse or she's going to watch Urban Cowboy. I mean, it's true. <laughs> I don't know how many times I'm like, you know what I haven't watched in like three weeks? Urban Cowboy. I'm going to watch that right now. Listen, I don't know what it if is. you only got about 45 minutes worth of time, another episode of NYPD Blue. NYPD Blue. I have to stop <laughs> myself every time. I'm like, you don't need to watch it anymore. You've seen it enough. But but I got like 45 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I know what happened already. <laughs> All right. Well, before we get started, this movie is so packed with especially 80s actors because it really is like the end of the 80s. So it's like it's fitting that at the very end of the 80s, there's a compilation of all these people into a single movie so before we move on we want to look at the guest stars that are in this movie because this is a big one we got sly stallone plays lieutenant ray tango and obviously we've talked about him a bunch in our rocky 2 podcast i did a pretty did a pretty deep dive on him he's rambo all the expendables movies lately like he's still rocking and rolling i don't feel like i need to introduce sly to people anymore instead i think i will take this time to say that sometime around may 2000 he announced demolition man 2 and i have not heard a peep since what is going on with that i want my demolition man 2 i know uh wesley snipes is ready <laughs> uh, <laughs> Wesley's like, I'll be in it. I'm just saying, I want my Demo Man 2 movie. Hey, just for the record, Demolition Man and Tango and Cash are very similar movies because of the puns and the yeah. layout and action with some silliness, a little bit of futurism. Anyways, just an observation. Now, it's been confirmed we are getting our Expendables 4. Uh, still what? no word on Demolition <laughs> Man t- 2. So. Who the hell is going to be an expendable? I have no idea. I have no idea. I have no idea. But it, it, it it'll like, be what? fun. <laughs> you know they're gonna they're gonna somehow get Steven Seagal. They're gonna smuggle him in from Russia somehow. He's sorry. He's gonna wear the biggest kimono they've ever created. <laughs> it's special made, okay? It's not full of dynamite, by the way. Those are hot dogs. <laughs> So obviously our other big star is Kurt Russell, who plays Lieutenant Gabriel Cash. And I already told you, spoiler, that they wanted Patrick Swayze. I mean, there's tons about Kurt Russell that I could talk to you about. His dad, Bing, plays the van driver in this very movie. He also owned a minor league baseball team. And there's a documentary they just released shortly about the shenanigans that went on with that. And if you know anything about minor league baseball, it is the goofiest of all of these sports. (laughs) There were plenty of shenanigans as far as kurt russell goes he was a child actor and he was actually in a number of westerns you know when he was like nine ten years old he was in the uh travels of jamie mcfeet mc mc mcfeeters i don't know i'm sure my dad watches it (laughs) Uh, he was so like at like 
At 11 years old, he was given a 10-year contract by Walt Disney himself. And he voiced movies, acted in, in a lot of those old Disney channel, uh, old Disney uh, stuff. And then uh, in 1979, he played Elvis Presley. And he married the actress who played Priscilla. Her name was Susan Hubley. So taking his work home with him. <laughs> so they would eventually get divorced. He would make Escape from New York and Escape from L.A., which is uh, Snake P Pliskin, his greatest character. And somewhere between the Escape from New York and him escaping L.A., he would make a bunch of movies with Goldie Hawn and he would marry her. Or I don't know if they ever actually officially got married. Yeah, they're not married. They're still together, think... but they're not married. He is an avid gun enthusiast, a staunch supporter of the Second Amendment, a hunter, and an FAA licensed private pilot. So something crazy, I don't know if you have notes down there about that, but he's the person that supposedly reported the Phoenix Lights. What? He was flying his plane oh. over Arizona and he saw the Phoenix Lights and reported it. It was it's like the most one of the most famous UFOs. So he's crazy sightings. too then? I'm just kidding. He just, he's just like, that's like a radio signal of him. Yeah. I called in like, hey, I just saw this over here because he's buying his plane. So mm -hmm. like, you want to make While sure you get his guns or what? <laughs> well, not, and he owns like 72 acres in like Boulder, Colorado or something. So anyway, so yeah, I wouldn't be, on. I wouldn't be surprised if he's some kind of like an end of the world hoarder has tons of guns and a buried container in his backyard. But <laughs> hey, I mean, what are you going to do with all that money? Like just buy shit and bury it. <laughs> yeah. Well, so, at least he didn't uh, buy a piece of land by Mar-a-Lago, so <laughs> there's that. The only disappointing thing about Kurt Russell is I feel for Gen Z, young millennials and Gen Z, is that the only way they know Kurt Russell is as Santa Claus. No. Ego, yeah, but <laughs> yeah. otherwise, like, they just know him as Santa Claus, and that's such a shame. Right on a wire, mm. Captain Ron. Like, come Overboard? On. Overboard. Yeah, come on. Mm -hmm. Come on, people. Our next guest star is Terry Hatcher. She plays Catherine, the sister. She played Lois Lane in ABC's Lois and Clark, The New Adventures of Superman from 93 to 97. She was also Susan Mayer on Desperate Housewives from 04 to 2012. So pretty two pretty long-running roles. And she's also a former 49ers cheerleader. So there's that. Hmm. Is she from the Bay Area? Yeah, she's originally from Palo Alto. Oh, wow. Uh -huh. And that brings me to Jack Palance. Guys, I'm just going to say, he is a candidate for most interesting man in the world. I swear, they need to make a movie about him. So he plays Yves Pere in the movie. He was born Vladimir Palinuk, like uh, Chuck Palinuk, like the author. Uh -huh. He changed his name to Jack Palance. Now, get this. His dad was a miner, and his dad died of black lung. Mm. He was working in the mines, too, when he was first in high school, but he got out of there with a football scholarship from the University of North Carolina. He did eventually drop out of the University of North Carolina and start boxing under the name Jack Brazo. He would win his first 15 fights, 12 by knockout, but would finally lose in a four-round decision to future heavyweight Joe Baskey. In December 1940, then World War II would break out, and he would serve in the Air Force as a bomber pilot. He would get wounded, like bad, and he received a Purple Heart after being wounded in contact, and a Good Conduct Medal, and a World War II Victory Medal. Wow. He had to have a bunch of plastic surgery, and so after he got out of the Army and healed from his injuries, he resumed college at Stanford, pursued a journalism degree, <laughs> was a sports writer for the San Francisco Chronicle before he got the acting bug. He would start off as a stage actor, debuting in 1947's The Big Two. He would follow up as the understudy to Marlon Brando as Stanley Kowalski in the Broadway classic streetcar named desire wow. he would eventually build a long acting career most no known as playing the villain with his notable stare that he got from all the plastic surgery <laughs> so he would he would he he basically played the bad guy in a bunch of westerns in the 40s and 50s and then he transitioned that to being like Bond villains and stuff like that. He was even curly in City Slickers. And that's all so, I know him as. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I'm saying like, like c clearly he's a candidate for most interesting man in the world. I mean, God, like any of that, it's just a little bit of that is like book worthy. Well, you now, know? I but, now I feel bad for wanting to say later that he really mailed it in on this movie. <laughs> <laughs> But can 
you imagine having plastic surgery back then? Yeah. Like what it was entailed back then? They're oh, like, listen, yeah. we got some like <laughs> some glue and rubber. Hammer. <laughs> We're just going to throw it on there and hope it sticks. <laughs> and so then that brings us to the honorable mentions of our guest stars. We have Brian James and James Hong, who I just wanted to mention because they're in Blade Runner and Blade Runner is awesome. And there's all kinds of correlations between this movie and Blade Runner. So, <laughs> listen, I I love Brian James. He has been in so many movies that yeah. we love, and it's like bit parts. You only see him for like a few minutes. He's in it. He's rarely ever like a main feature, but he appears in the most random movies, like that one that we watched with um, Laser Force, or yeah, yeah. Was like it was the future, <laughs> and it was uh, Michael Dudikoff with him. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's funny is I I watched um. Broken Arrow. Broken Arrow. I watched Broken Arrow earlier. I think he's in that. I think he's one of the bad guys. I think he's one of the henchmen in that. Yeah. I just randomly put that on. Yeah. He's definitely (laughs) a ghost. He's never a good guy. He was in Enemy (laughs) Mind. (laughs) <laughs> oh my god yeah. he was. <laughs> he's just the go-to henchman in, in movies gotta mention robert zador samurai cop and maniac cop depending on which way you go uh i feel like some people are samurai cop some people are like are maniac cop i lean maniac cop i know dom i know you're a samurai cop so. listen samurai cop all the way yeah <laughs> maniac cop is good and, 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 and for what it's worth maniac cop's got bruce campbell in it and I love me, Bruce mm-hmm. Campbell. A young Bruce Campbell. Yes. Mm-hmm. But Samurai, Samurai Cop. Samurai Cop's got so much. <laughs> <laughs> Samurai Cop 2's got Tommy in it. Like, Aww. you gotta like the whole so, series. Yeah. <laughs> so, and it turns out Robert Zadar is extremely talented. He was also a singer, keyboardist, and guitar player. Now, if they say keyboardist and guitar player, that means he played a guitar. The guitar. You know yeah, it. Exactly. He played the guitar and sang in the band, <laughs> in a Chicago-based band called Nova Express. We will find... That footage, because apparently they opened for Jefferson Airplane and The Who, so there's got to be oh. footage of him on the keytar out there. Wow. Uh, he was also a jingle writer for a while. He was a Chicago cop and a brief stint as a Chippendales dancer. Oh my god, find the footage of that. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's... Listen, the same thing as Brian James. I love Robert Zadar. Yeah. He's another one of those people that appears in a ton of movies. And as, as soon as you see him, you're like pointing at the screen like, that's mid-face. <laughs> <laughs> He's been in a bunch of movies with Joe Estevez, too. So mm-hmm. you know it's a good yeah. team on that one. <laughs> When those two, <laughs> you know, when those two are in a movie, they're bringing you some solid acting. <laughs> the worst part of uh, uh, both of these guys that I love Brian James or I love Robert Siddhar, they love because they clearly love to make the same kind of movies that we love to watch. Both of them have died. Yeah. Very sad. Aww. It is very sad. Yeah. yeah. Well, and then that brings us to Michael Jeter, who also isn't with us. He plays Skinner. He was also in the Green Wa- Mile and uh, Waterworld. But most of you guys will know him as Mr. Noodle on Elmo's World and Sesame Street. His brother, Mr. Noodle. <laughs> He's Mr. Noodle's brother, Mr. Noodle. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It took me a minute to figure that out. Like, what the hell are they talking about? <laughs> He's Mr. Noodle's brother, Mr. Noodle. And Mr. Noodle has a poodle named Schnoodle. (laughs) I just watched Elmo's World today. So that's why. Tell me about four kids. (laughs) I literally just watched Elmo's World. My favorite part about Sesame Street is that he clearly has passed away and it clearly was filmed a long time ago, but they do not. They still include it in some way in the newer the newer episodes. They still put Mr. Noodle in there. So and then now it's moved yeah. on and there's Miss Noodle, his sister, and and they have made it um different ethnicities and different you know, so it's just celebrities. Nice. Yeah, celebrities and yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's nice. They took the, so they took over the house and, yeah. and so <laughs> trying to sell it. <laughs> Listen, everyone's goal in life is to be Gallagher's brother. <laughs> <That's all laughs> <I'm saying. laughs> <laughs> okay, so I think we got enough prep work ahead of us. I'm ready to talk about Tango and Cash. Let's. I, I'm ready. My I've been ready for ready. years. <laughs> Let's, Let's totally break this one down. When we open up, we're gonna get both a setup for Tango and Cash. They're independent, 
So Tango first and then Cash, because, you know, Sly, he's the big star. Not that mm-hmm. Kurt Russell guy, whoever he is. Did you know that a movie's going to be good when it starts mid-car chase? <laughs> True, yeah. High-speed chase right off the bat. <laughs> what I love about the open is that it really is, it's the end of the 80s, and we're at the end of 80s action movies. And so they put every trope of 80s action movies in the first two opening scenes. Because with Tango... It's a big chase. He's in a convertible. He's wearing he... suspenders. <laughs> <laughs> Nerdy Sly was never going to fly, by the way. Like, no, 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 no. He pulls away ahead. He has that little teeny gun. He's like, peep, peep, <laughs> shoot at the, at the windshield. <laughs> yeah. What, why does the guy stop? Why did not he just plow right through him? It's going I know. Up Movie over. My coke's getting to where it's going, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> then, of course, the highway patrol don't believe him and they say he wasted their time i'm gonna have your badge pal and then he shoots the container and a bunch of coke comes pouring out we can all agree those guys really worked for the higher patrol though <laughs> with those mullets like that uh-huh. and we all know that say, chp is uh, known for being jerks so <laughs> I, I was gonna say like how do you feel if you're like a, a sheriff or, or a chp and you're always portrayed as kind of being a, a d-bag in movies i think you feel like that's what you are <laughs> because <laughs> that's what they are if you've, ever, yeah. <laughs> if you've ever had interaction with them that's what they are <laughs> not chips okay yeah not john baker no <laughs> ponch and john baker no 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 no. that's a different story ponch riding that motorcycle he can all never I, be mean <laughs> all i know is rambo's a pussy <laughs> So it's great that they give that line, and then also that Palance dri- or Pere drives by. Yeah, Tango, and then they yeah. like drive on. It's it's such a memorable one of the classic openings for these kinds of movies because then the next one is Russell going home, and he's like blue collar guy, right? Jeans and a T-shirt. You can say it. He lives in the ghetto. Cowboy boots. <laughs> he's got a nice car. It's got a garage, but then he lives in the shithole apartment. And yeah, he doesn't clean. And all the kids are like, "Hey, cash, cash, cash!" And he closes the door on their faces. <laughs> <laughs> What gets me is that when he immediately when he walks in, there's this assassination attempt, and he's already wearing a bulletproof. Like he just walks around every day with a bulletproof vest on, gun in his boot, like always ready. Like, does he get assass? Do assassination attempts happen like every Tuesday for him? <laughs> I do appreciate that they don't even pre- pretend to be like he's gonna die. Like, because that would be like a re- another th- trope would be like, oh my god, is he gonna die? It's like in the very beginning of the movie, like we know he's not gonna die. He goes through the whole movie, so don't uh-huh. pretend like it. He's, he's like, no, he's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Have you seen Executive Decision? <laughs> But the, yeah, there's a sensation through the mirror. They wrestle. They go out on the street. He has to commandeer a car from someone who gets really pissed. It's like the pissed off civilian. Can't believe he took my car. Even though there's clearly uh-huh. like a shootout yeah, and going a police on. chase yeah. going on right now. And you're pissed off about the shape that, that your car is in. Uh, it's like, it's just everything. Every trope, as fast as you can, in the hmm. very first seven minutes of the movie. And then after he catches them, they like continue the trope all the way into the station. Where it's like, oh, he's the cool cop but he, he breaks all the rules whereas tango's this button up bored ceo type and then he goes into a bathroom slash break room i guess um <laughs> yeah i don't understand that either it's like the bathroom what? slash break room slash where they keep prisoners <laughs> what <laughs> and why is there a random chair in there i have no idea <laughs> Like just a random folding chair. I didn't even cross my mind. Like, why is there a chair? Is it a locker room too? Do they keep a chair in there? It must be like a locker room slash bathroom. It's it's everything. This is exactly what you would find at Ronald Reagan International <laughs> Airport. <laughs> <laughs> they, got a, they got a SWAT team in there in that bathroom. A CSI department. <laughs> Well, turns out this guy, minding his own business, taking a leak, Cash just throws him to the ground and sits on his neck. No. The cooties <laughs> everywhere. I know. So, hasn't he heard of Miranda rights or anything? So, <laughs> uh, that guy. And that's what it is about this the open from when we meet the two characters, they get straight to the point. This is Tango. He's buttoned up, gonna wear a suit. Everyone accuses him of being a banker. They say he d- doesn't fit in. He's like, he gets a call from his. Like stock accountant broker. and stockbroker in the office, and then there's Cash, who's like eating pizza before it gets thrown away. And he's like, he's like loading his gun as he's walking, like pointing it at people. 
Like uh-huh. the fight doesn't work. Get uh-huh. me a new vest. And- <laughs> <laughs> Which that's the the beginning of the setup. Him noticing his sight is off on his gun. Yeah. So and so. we meet, and we meet Catherine too, who's there to uh, talk to her brother about where she does her cage dancing. Her no, no, she's dancing. gonna go. She wants to go. On, she's supposed to go to Vegas. She's mm, going on a right. trip, and he's like, "No, do, I don't do, think you should go." Do strippers travel? Like, do they tour? Well, she's I not a stripper. Let's get this straight. Uh, she's, she's not a stripper. stripper. She's, she's not a stripper. Strip. She's, she's a, a stripper. dancer. She's yeah. like a like an artistic dancer. That that's what they're they're saying. She's not a stripper. She no one's like no money in her underwear. They're, strippers don't have like <laughs> extravagant light shows and <laughs> glitter bombs. Oh, I mean, I guess I they do what, it. What kind of strip clubs you've been to? I've hey. been to some fancy ones. Yes, I'm <laughs> saying. Apparently, I'm in Portland. <laughs> hey. It, it, it starts out dancing in the leotard and then it ends dancing by the airport. Yeah. But she never, for the record, she doesn't take her clothes all the way off. She's just in like a bikini. And the other person. We only who, see the one, we only see the one performance. No, we um, see two performances. And, and, the person before and, her rides off on a motorcycle wearing a bathing suit. <laughs> <laughs> what they get out of, or what Cash gets out, is that the person who's trying to assassinate him was sent by Quan. And we know that Quan and some other guy, they don't, I don't think they ever say his name, the other guy that's it's like, like French or something. Yeah, <laughs> they're working with Pere. Now, listen, Pere has the serious hookups because we're going to see later he's able to get into prison. But where does he get all these tapes of the bus that Tango and Cash <laughs> have done? <laughs> From the co- do you have I other cops that's... that are like crooked or something? Are they filming it? It's the eighties. They got like this huge like <laughs> suitcase sized camera with them when they're busting in. No idea. Drug bus well, and stuff. It, it's like the greatest meeting too, because they're like in the evil gun factory, <laughs> and they're all sitting around, and the boss man's like losing it, just ranting about some plan. And I love like Quan's like you know like couldn't we just kill him? Like, wouldn't that be quicker and easier? Those seem to be very good points. Yeah. Like, quicker <laughs> and easier. <laughs> I just love that he's got those two rats just for illustrating points. Yeah, but he keeps them in a box. <laughs> but how much did the maze bar top cost? Like, he's put some serious <laughs> thought into this. <laughs> We didn't even see he, if they finished the maze. He just put them in there. We didn't even see what they did. He designed the room around a bar top maze. He designed <laughs> the room around these rats. Okay? So, I'm not sure if he's the one that should be making the decisions around there. So, But, of course, in 80s bad guy style, he is going to get rid of them in the most elaborate way possible, utilizing way more money and connections than it would ever take to just hire five guys to just drive and pop them. Yeah, that's what, because this plan starts off complicated, and then gets even more complicated, right? He convinces Quan and the other guy. They're going to set all this up so that Tango and Cash are going to go to prison. Then the, the, the gang here will be able to do whatever they want because Tango and Cash will be off the street. Mm-hmm. But then once they get into prison, this other elaborate plan to kill them while they're in prison. So why not just kill them on, on the street then? But no, he said he wanted yeah. to kill them because he didn't want to turn them into martyrs. Mm, that's right. He so said, he, yeah. he oh. needed to defame them mm-hmm. first and then, and kill, then them. kill them. Yeah, because if he's like, if we tr- if we kill them when they're now, when they're at the top of their game, They'll just turn into heroes and martyrs, and we don't need that. They'll never work. We'll never be able to do whatever we want. Which, Look at Melissa it's paying just... attention to the plot. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. I mean, I'm how sorry, many times have just... we seen it? <laughs> it? It just feels like an episode of Inspector Gadget. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> go, Gadget, go. <laughs> We know now they're going to set up Tango and Cash to get arrested. We also know that the assailant that cash survives was sent by Quan. He says he doesn't have any other <laughs> sorry. I- information. It could have been a little bit sorry, but maybe they could have been a little bit more like um elaborate with them picking who the who they of course it comes from the Asian guy. It's the Asian <laughs> guy who's coming to do the shooting. <laughs> I mean Put some more. Come on, go on the side of the box a little bit. <laughs> so Tango so, and Cash both learn at the same time that there's some deal going down on Front Street. They learn independently, and then not knowing that each other are also going to go there because apparently their precincts don't have jurisdictions. They're just allowed to work wherever they want. Well, because they're Tango and Cash, they don't follow all the rules, just some of the rules. <laughs> mm-hmm. Both show up at one, two, three Fake Street. Not a setup. Not a setup. <laughs> 
<laughs> they go in, they bump into each other. He's got, uh, Cash has got that ridiculous gigantic sight on his gun that's like bigger than the gun. <laughs> they sit there and they argue and they throw some puns and insults at each other. And then they get arrested and the cops that arrest them and their reaction makes me think that like they've always been a little suspic suspicious of these guys. Because they're like hero cops and they arrest them and they're like, I knew it. I knew you guys were dirty. <laughs> no one must have liked them at all. Well, I'm sure that was like eternal affairs, right? Because they knew they were like, we finally got you guys. So like, okay, so you've been following us around. like, <laughs> But this just happened like two days ago. <laughs> I'm very uh -huh. confused. <laughs> the more that we talk about it, the more that I'm realizing how much of a parody it is of other 80s action movies. So I'm going to give you an example. This is clearly a lethal weapon. I was going to say, right? because yeah. Cash, he's totally rigged. Like yeah. Down to the hair, mm -hmm. to the like wild and, and crazy. You know, he doesn't have I like a wife or anything. He's off the deep end. He might even drive the same car. The other crossover is that Cash clearly has the time cop gun. Oh yeah. Oh, oh yeah. I didn't even <laughs> notice that. We're all like, what the hell? <laughs> It was the end of the decade. We're going to make a movie about the decade. Yeah. You can't have that gun. <laughs> <laughs> Not allowed. Can he do the splits? Then no. You can't have it. <laughs> Over two counters when there's a, when the water's being electrified underneath them? Sorry. You can't have it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So now they're officially busted. They were set up. His gun was there. There's a recording of them talking to the person who's now dead in the room. They're bone. Yeah, they're screwed. Yep. There's nothing they can do out of this. <laughs> the science guy, when he uh, testifies, too, he's even like, I used the science thingy thermometer, and <laughs> it, it proved that it was, in fact, a legitimate recording. <laughs> Nobody check. <laughs> Mr. Noodle, I can't believe you. <laughs> I love that it also involved the person who tried to assassinate Cash yeah. as a credible witness. He's like, yeah, he was really rough on me. Like, but did you try uh, to assassinate him? Yeah, but I mean, come on, he like hurt my neck a lot. Okay. Yeah, I was I trying to speak pee. English. <laughs> <laughs> they end up convincing them to plea for an eighteen-month sentence at a country club prison because they don't which... put cops in the general population. Mm -hmm. And we see this exchange. Where Tango is trying to be like the better than thou, I'm here to protect everyone, including another cop. So let me speak. We're going to take the plea. I didn't do what my lawyer wanted me to do, which is like rat you out to save myself to say that it was all your idea. Let's just both go to jail. We'll be on the same page. And that's what I love about Cash is that he's like, fuck do I care? Like, let's just do this thing. <laughs> yeah. Why, why do we have to be all prim and proper about it? Obviously, they get thrown in jail, but... Not the country club jail. They end up losing them somewhere around Mississippi-ish. And uh, oh, I thought I it was like just, Arizona. <laughs> I love that they just randomly show up in some prison and they're like, "Get in there!" <laughs> like, who are you? I don't know uh -huh. who they are either. <laughs> I'm sure you're supposed to be here. Thanks, Bing. <laughs> for driving them. That jail is completely out of control, too. That prison, everything's on fire. Trash is raining down from the sky. I mean, it's not very clean. No, like, <laughs> who is in charge of it? Where's the warden? I want to speak to the warden. I do want to circle back on Tango's speech that he gives in court, where it's supposed to be like, thank you for giving us leniency. And he says, all, I don't want this to be a bad mark on the police department. All cops are good cops. It's like, really? Not that one that flipped on you. Like, totally uh, <laughs> set you up and placed that gun, huh? Or maybe not you two that are now going to jail. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, in the prison scene, my favorite part about that is I want to ask Tango all, every time, like, are you tired of being wrong? Yeah, you're always wrong, man. <laughs> but you never admit well, it or never say you're sorry for being wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I just realized, too, that he, when Sly was making this movie, he's like, no, the prison scene wasn't right. I'm going to make a different prison movie with Jason Statham. <laughs> about this uh, uh, uh. prison that's buried deep underground uh, for <laughs> police officers and i get set up and sent down to it and i have to like escape it <laughs> oh it gets uh, have you seen two and three like, yes it gets we have worse. It gets i've seen worse. two not three i've seen two i, I saw three. three oh oh yeah just 
<laughs> they just gave up. Robots are roaming the prison. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so back to this prison. We get my favorite part is the lovely shower scene where they're both kind of complaining <laughs> and talking. And then there's a few times where I think they're they're doing what are the kids calling it these days? Docking. <laughs> So, but they've definitely grown closer. Their time. They're sharing the soap. It's all. <laughs> and, oh yeah. And, and one of them gets called Pee Wee. So, which is yes. which is what seals the scene. <laughs> yes. Yes. And we all which, know which, which one that was. <laughs> <laughs> which goes back to my theory about the docking. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just say he's no Dolph Lundgren. <laughs> <laughs> No one was impressed by it from a third of a mile away through a little <laughs> tiny window. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> the biggest one I've ever seen. So after the shower scene, which the guards are really nice to them, let them have the shower all to themselves. Yeah, what was that about? Like, uh-huh. apparently they, they, and he's like, I think they're going to put us in general population, mister. They don't put cops in general population. <laughs> but they get right down to business. They get put in their cells, and in the middle of that night, they then get kidnapped and brought down to, like, the prison basement. The electrical ward where they electrocute you for fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like the basement yeah. where they also have big drums of oil and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> And, and apparently the entire prison came out for this. Like everyone came out to root for them. So, and this is total 80s bad guy style. This is like Bond villain level. I'm going to show up for no apparent reason to tell you my master plan. <laughs> <laughs> when you don't even know I exist. Like you don't even, there's, for no reason to uh, other, other than to basically say, I'm the bad guy. Ha 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 ha. My master plan worked. <laughs> Luckily, there's at least one decent cop in or like the the assistant warden in there because he's able yes. to come save them while they're being electrocuted, which is again another like it's another action trope. Lethal weapon. So, yeah, exactly. They electrocuted the hell out of them. <laughs> <laughs> they really did. That's why he's so weird. <laughs> Saw that I'm behind the music. <laughs> I, I really feel for Matt, the assistant warden. Like, he must not have like, any power because this person's just all over the place. People just doing whatever they want. And he kind of looks like the guy from Office Space that's always looking for a stapler. <laughs> <laughs> He's so quick to have, have a plan for them to break out, too. I've been thinking about this for a long time, guys. <laughs> if you need to break out of this place... You have been here for exactly 12 hours. I've been thinking about this for three weeks. (laughs) Yes. Take me with you guys. (laughs) This was my escape plan. But now that you're here, all three of us can go. Yes. Oh, but he doesn't make it, though. <laughs> no, it, it, no, it's a good plan. And that's what I would say is that Cash immediately trusts him because he knows him. But Tango is out. But then comes back around on him because he knows that, like, there's got to be something wrong here. I suspect this is going to go as well as what Cash is saying. He, he basically gets up and to, to help Cash to make sure Cash doesn't die. This is, for me, the best part of the movie because this prison breakout scene is great. They go through all those hallways. It's raining. And then they have to zip line across the power lines what over the, the big wall. Drain? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. They go through the big drain with the spinning. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, 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 what is the ventilation system at that no prison? Are they like pumping oxygen to Mars? <laughs> That's what I was wondering. Like, where are these types of giant fans in these buildings? I have been inside and out of a bunch of different types of buildings. I have never seen a ventilation system like this. It's like they're, like I said, like they're pressurizing the whole subway. <laughs> But uh, one of the things, too, that I love about the prison escape scene is like the end of a level where you have to like fought, fight the boss guy because he ends up having to fight the big chin guy <laughs> to, in order to get and jump and do the zip lining down. Which, by the way, I'm not exactly sure if that works for high voltage lines, but we'll, yeah, we'll go with it. <laughs> Don't try it at home, is what we're saying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm just saying, I'm pretty sure you'll get shocked anyway. Uh, yes, yeah, so you're right. It's like a video game level change because he's, he's got to fight Zadar next to the electrical lines. And the only way he can win is by throwing him into him, not because he's stronger or faster no, than him. No, because you can never beat Zadar. He's getting his ass kicked. <laughs> yeah. One thing he yes. can do is just win by momentum. Kind of reminds me of the first level of Double Dragon for all of you. <laughs> so they land outside. Cash says, listen, I really do owe you one. Tango says, cool, you can find me at the club. All right, see ya. <laughs> Look for Catherine. Yeah. <laughs> 
okay. jump back to the bad guys, and they're kind of having that meeting that you never want to have with your boss, where your boss screwed up, and you're like, uh, boss, uh, you, 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 your plan's not kind of working out. And it just makes me wonder, like, do these guys ever just stop? and think maybe i'm just bad at being a criminal maybe i should just stop get into real estate or something if if the prison scene is my favorite scene the biggest question i have is who the fuck is this weapons guy that cash knows those yeah they don't, we don't know his name until like the last 15 minutes of the movie we know that he's owen who does he work for what does he do why does he do these things we have zero clue well i think he works for the police department that's what he's doing well, that he works for the police department and he's building like prototypes for the police but they, or, or whatever, like he's a contractor for the police department. He's building prototypes for the police to eventually use in like, the, those weapons or whatever. Is the LAPD's budget so big that they actually have like a Q guy that just does gadgets? I mean, like, I it, don't know. Is it really you, that big at this point? <laughs> you think about like all the all the cities now that have like tanks and crap that they they pull out. I'm a, I think LA well, probably has a huge budget for that kind of stuff. <laughs> I don't think it's high and, tech, and, but you know. <laughs> and to be fair, I mean that like the the RV from hell that they drive at the end is like a souped up Dodge Ram. So. Exactly. Yeah, it was like, and they put okay. some cool lights on it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, I see what you mean. So now they're each going to go their separate ways to get the people that they said in court that they were going to basically kill when they were in court like we're, we're gonna get that guy but they don't kill him but you know that's he can't kill mr noodle <laughs> <laughs> cash goes to see mr noodle the sound guy like hey what's up how did you do it and he confesses he confesses and he also says well I'll show you how i did it with my 16 boom boxes taped together <laughs> yes and lots of light I love, too <laughs> i love the whole giant computer wall he folds very fast tells them that some grouchy guy that lives in the trash can hired him <laughs> And then <laughs> at the FBI guy house where Tango goes, he falls away fast too. Listen, I did. I know I planted that gun. You want half the money? I'll give you half. <laughs> yeah. Let's go to the police station right now. I'll go confess. Because he's the FBI. You know they have no no guts, no glory. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that the bad guys knew he was gonna squeal, so they automatically just stuck a bomb on his car. Like, <laughs> we know he's gonna give up, so we'll just blow his car up. <laughs> he's such a squealer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So now Cash is going to go try and find Tango. So he's going to go to Cleopatra's. And this is the cringy scene, right? So we see Terry Hatcher or Catherine dance. That's that's all right. We see them like connect. He goes backstage. Like it's all everything is going fine. And then there's the plan to escape all the cops that like are there. A woman. I will say this: the scene is pretty stupid because they show up like all the cops show up, and then like he does the they try and throw you off with the oh you know what size is that jacket? Which clearly it must have been too small since she ends up wearing the jacket. That plan was never going to work. Work. Okay, um, but but hold on, hold on a second. I did have a couple things that I forgot to mention that I want to. I I have to mention them here now. One in the prison scene when they're being tortured, Billy Blanks is in that scene yes, somewhere. He's in there. Oh yeah, he's one yeah, of the prisoners. He's one of, yeah, he's one of the thugs. Two proof Two. that Billy Blanks is in every movie we do. Yes. <laughs> To the person that he says, what size is your jacket? That is Shabadoo. Yep. Electric oh. Boogaloo. Alfonso Cleones. Go. Yep. I was going to I was gonna say that um, my argument with her being a stripper is still, I'm still going to argue that because she gets the drumsticks and has clearly no ability to drum. No, so. oh, no. No, no, yeah. She's terrible uh, at drumming. She and no one says nothing. anything. <laughs> and no one says anything. So, like, they're clearly not there to listen to her music. <laughs> And then the last part is that that cop that's distracted by Catherine on stage when they're trying to leave, he's like, "Hey, how about a three way?" Yeah, what? Mm -hmm. <laughs> who are these guys? Who's who? Why were they immediately willing to turn over Tango and Cash? Because clearly, the rest of the police department isn't worth two beans. <laughs> yes, we go back to Catherine's house. Obviously, Kurt Russell's going to try and bone her because I mean, why not? She's a stripper. <laughs> Got to be. Who is so. he, Brian Urlacher? <laughs> also, he thinks it's Tango's like girlfriend. He's like, so how do you, how much do you and Tango spend together? How much time do you guys spend together? So mm. you know this and that. Oh, okay, yeah. Well, listen, okay, hold on though, hold on. If he thinks that she's Tango's girlfriend, why is he letting her give him a massage? Because he's, he's gonna he's against like to go against Tango. <laughs> <laughs> he's gonna show Pee Wee who's boss. That's what he's gonna do. <laughs> Also, please explain to me 
where if you had a friend that you like you're a reluctant friend right you're like they're not really friends they just kind of like have are just stuck together and he had a stripper girlfriend and she was going to give you a massage you're telling me you turn it down uh, <laughs> on the merit that, that they might may be dating not at his house hey, anywhere hey, else hey, that's her house. House. Hey, yeah but hey, still, melissa like, melissa if you worked as a waitress and some guy came up and said Hey, are you Melissa? Would you invite him back to your house and give him a massage? No, she knows who he is. How? She, because she, okay, because her brother was on trial with him. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, she asked that him. That is a good she point. Goes, that how is, a good how point. is Tango? And he goes, he's okay. Don't worry. You know, whatever. We're supposed to meet up again. And she's like, okay, I'll help you. That's why she helped so him. Then she how sees does he, him getting going to be get he picked up. Not, how does he not know that she's his sister then? Because he doesn't like say. He said, just meet me at this club and ask for Catherine. So he just assumes that Catherine is his so, girlfriend. So the entire trial, they never interacted at all? Her and No, she wasn't there. They didn't show her the sister at the trial. But either way, it was all, all on right, the scene. All right, all right. There was a whole but, thing where she was like, hey, how's my brother doing? No, no, she didn't say I have a brother. She goes, how's Tango doing? And he's like, don't worry. He's okay. He's going to meet up. With, we're going to meet up later. We went our separate ways. And she's like, okay, well, we have to get you out of here. I'm going to help do, you. And how are we going to get out? And then that whole that scene. And then they talk about, he's like, so do you see Tango that much, any that much or whatever? And she's like, Oh, when I can, you know, and then he's like trying to piece it together thinking like they're dating. So let's get back to Tango sneaking into his sister's apartment and watching her have sex. Yeah, he what jumps the out hell? The screen. <laughs> that seems a little creepy to me. It what? is creepy. He should have announced his, he was there right away. Like not, he sees her on the couch, knock on the door. Why is he like waiting to see if they're going to have like, sex? <laughs> Cause like, wouldn't it have been wouldn't it have been worse if she was actually having sex with him at that point? Like because yeah. he's just standing in the living room, just watching from the doorway. <laughs> yeah. And then yes, of course. And then there's someone there. So he jumps across the couch to save her and cash. And and then it's uh it's the great sum up scene where it's like it's the boss. Oh yeah, and I have proof that gets us off the hook. Oh, and here's a lead. <laughs> <laughs> we know who this and requiem guy is you, and here's his address you should go see him and by the way we have this tape now that'll get us off it'll prove our our innocence are you ready to go murder a small town <laughs> <Let's do it. laughs> yes <laughs> all right good i will leave and you will not see me for the rest of the movie <laughs> and also were you trying to bone my sister <laughs> So now they're off to see Red Re Queen, and they do the good cop or the bad cop, bad er, cop r r routine <laughs> with a grenade taped to his face, which is actually a really great scene. I think that this ends up being spoofed like in a bunch of other movies after that, too, or like a reference to that. And it ends with them dropping the dud that down his pants. Mm -hmm. But they are able to get mm -hmm. out of him who Pere is, and they don't even know who the hell he is, so... They're like, who's that? So, <laughs> what's funny is, is that they're hanging them over the building, and that doesn't work. And then they do the grenade thing, and that does work. Through the rest of the movie, any time that they're not actually wor actively working the investigation, all they're talking about is Kurt Russell bumping uglies with it, Tango's sister. That's every conversation outside of what they're doing. So, like, it actually ends up being the final conversation of the movie. Oh, yeah, yeah like, that's it, true. This, that, that's the only thing that they talk about for the rest of the movie. Yeah, so we go, and they're still talking about it. We go, they get the RV from hell from the LAPD tech exchange, whatever <laughs> they've got going on down there. So, and he just lets them borrow it. Like, yeah, go ahead, you know. It's only a few <laughs> million dollars invested into this uh, Dodge Dakota. <laughs> Like, can't you see? We glued a Gatling gun to it. Okay, so they're all set up now. They know who the person is. They know what he's up to. They know what they need to bring with them. They get their weapon of choice. And now they're going to subtly sneak around. No, get they're... inside. No, wait, I'm sorry. Drive that thing straight through the front door. <laughs> yeah. Get in a shootout with grading equipment. A Caterpillar was all up in this movie. They, they, is, they were ready to go. The ending of this movie is one of the reasons why I love these type of movies. Because it is balls to the walls. Hey, guys, we're going to start with a monster truck fight. We're going to start with a monster <laughs> truck fight. Not not that's going to happen or that's the big, that's the big. No, we're going to start with the monster truck fight. We're going to blow some stuff up. Those tractors that they're destroying, they're like a hundred grand a piece. They're not easy to drive. And then, of course, like this is all going to take place. 
at the the perfect evil bad guy lair of the abandoned airport that every town seems to have. <laughs> and then, like you said, th- then, then they're going to massacre a small town with automatic weapons <laughs> until getting to the final boss fights, which is just like the greatest way to end every movie. And then everything blows up. Yes. And when even when they get inside, we still got time for karate. They got to have a karate fight now with or Tango does and then Cash fights Requeen. And Mm -hmm. then there's still the Palance mirror or the parade mirror shot that they have to get to. So it it even ends with the Hall of Mirrors and the whole building. Who is doing construction on this place? (laughs) The rat maze? The mirror maze? It's all wired to blow? Yeah. How do they get there... permits for this? <laughs> Why is there a hall of mirrors in an airport to begin with? <laughs> <laughs> did Maybe the Joker the design house. this? Yeah. It's the fun house. <laughs> How did they get permits to wire the whole thing up with explosives? I mean, How? what the hell? Is this the Denver airport? <laughs> You know what I'm talking about. Out front and that, those dude, those graders are fast. They're able to keep up with that RV from hell, and they like pinch it together. Have you ever been on a job site? Those things go like 13 miles an hour. Yeah, yeah. And they are not that easy to drive. They're manual transmissions. They're pain in the ass. <laughs> There's a reason you can't drive them more than 10 miles an hour. That's so. the reason why they crash into each other inside of the building. They just can't steer it. It's a small nugget. The actual one, like at least one of the monster trucks is actually Bigfoot without, a, without it's all of its decorations. It so really the, had everybody. It really had yeah. every, everything. Yeah. Is, the only thing is missing. is like a fucking elf appearance or some shit. <laughs> yeah. He was there. You just didn't see him. <laughs> he was in the prison scene. <laughs> and then they do the whole mirrors trick. And then after everything explodes, and they magically run to safety. It ends with happily ever after. This ending is so batshit crazy that you ignore like how crazy it is just because it's so fun. Yeah, and then at the very ending, you get the front page of Hero Cops Reinstated. And guys, let me just tell you something fun. Fun fact. Technically, breaking out of prison is a crime. <laughs> and even though, even though they, the other crimes would have been, uh, may have been absolved, they may have proven themselves not guilty for those other crimes. The fact that they broke out of prison is still a crime, and they would have to go back to prison for that. By all the those way, weapons, so. all those people that they killed, can they prove in court that all those people were fighting against them? Were they just innocent construction people on site that day? Yeah, there's no way they would Maybe. reinstate them, even if they were found like it was that they did figure out they were set up. They would never be able to go back to be cops. No one would ever trust them. No, no like no. lieutenant is going to have them in their force. <laughs> well, and what's worse is that the only people that can co- corroborate their story is all dead. Everyone is dead. Because they Anyone killed that they could, Because they killed everybody. They just killed everybody. So, except maybe the science guy, but you can't trust him. He already admitted he f- faked his work. <laughs> so, that's tango and cash and it's a lot of fun despite its flaws it's still a lot of fun you still get sucked into it really easily it's still a great pairing of sly and kurt russell that i would i would have watched and in that era a bunch of times which it it feels like Mm -hmm. it was a missed opportunity because of how difficult it was to work with sly back then (laughs) then, (laughs) you act like it's it's better now (laughs) but it's still so much fun it takes from so many other movies that even though it's like there's lots of parts that are laugh out loud bad it's still so much fun that every year it's like hey you want to watch tango and cash every year yeah Yeah. i think we watch it every six months (laughs) (laughs) well and and i think for me too is that you know both guys are are standalone action heroes in so many movies it's one of the rare times that they actually did pair up with anybody i just i always love watching this movie like it like i said the ending of this movie is the reason why I love these movies. Like, every bit of it. The, we're just going to go big or go home. I want a truck with a Gatling gun mounted to the side <laughs> and monster trucks. And what are those big things on construction sites? The ones with the giant wheel? I want those, too. And we're just going <laughs> to blow shit up. It doesn't have to make any sense. Exactly. And that's the same thing with the story. So instead of trying to link things together and have it be like match up perfectly, you have two choices, right? You can take it and you can be like, we're going to be very serious and 
and be very dot all our I's and cross all our T's and make this story so it makes total sense and is believable. Well, let's go to Silly Town. Let's put a yeah. huge scope on his gun. Let's give him a boot gun. <laughs> <laughs> put him in jail. Make him zip line out of it. <laughs> yeah, well, hell, they can jump. They can make it to those electrical lines. Let him jump. <laughs> well, before we get too deep into our final thoughts, let's go take a look at the music that there was in this movie. This is one, another one of those ones because it's 80s. It's probably a good spread of generic background music and then also some secret good 80s music that's in there too so let's go take a look all right john in the music for this movie it's another one of those ones that you're so locked into the story it's kind of hard to pay attention to what the background music is so i'm very intrigued at what you got this week we have a good mix of different stuff i i completely understand what you're saying it felt like every scene because of the the corny kind of background music it felt like every scene was kind of a soundtrack of a guy on a guitar with a drum machine so like you didn't really notice <laughs> any difference between that and the music and here's why we got best of what i got by bad english which is written by John White, Jonathan Kane, and Neil Sean. Basically, Bad English is a glam metal supergroup that existed from 87 to 91 that is primarily, almost exclusively made up of former Journey members after they disband. So it's basically Journey called Bad English. It's Journey um, 2. <laughs> Journey 2. They're most known for one hit, When I See You Smile, which if you listen to it, sounds very much like a Journey song or a Bad English song depending on how you view it. <laughs> <laughs> the song peaked at number one on the Billboard Hot 100 in 1989. They would eventually break up and later join Journey again. <laughs> so, <laughs> Journey two and a half. <laughs> that brings us to Let the Day Begin by The Call. The Call was actually a legit band for a little bit in the 80s. The song is written by Michael Ben. B-E-E-N. Michael Ben was, uh, started this band in Santa Cruz, California in 1980 with Scott Music, M-U-S-I-C-K. <laughs> I don't know. Ben Music might have been a better name than The Call, but I don't know. I mean, it's not like it was in their name. <laughs> and Tom Ferrier, Jim Goodwin was also there. <laughs> they made nine <laughs> studio albums and actually at one point Damn. achieved regular rotation on MTV. This song was their number one hit and reached mainstream rock charts all the way to number one and was actually the official campaign song for Al Gore, which is probably oh, wow. what ruined their career. <laughs> so, we also have Don't Go by the band Yazoo, which is written by Vince Clark. And so and they're an English synth pop duo from Basildon, wherever the hell that is. That sounds like some made up place in Narnia. They're from Basildon. It's the band Yazoo. <laughs> and so and it features former Depeche Mode member Vincent Clark and some chick he was banging named Allison Moyer. <laughs> Well, that just puts so, it in perspective. <laughs> uh, they made two albums together from in a span of about 18 months. And albums were called Upstairs at Eric's and You and Me Both. They topped the UK charts when they broke up. Clark went created a band called Erasure, where Moyet, uh, Moyet went on to have a solo career. Good for her. So our next song is Poison by the one, the only, Alice Cooper. So Alice Cooper's real name is Vincent Fernier. He's a singer-songwriter with a career spanning of 50 years and is known as the godfather of shock rock. Alice Cooper is actually the original name of the band and actually goes all the way back to 1964. His original band, Vincent's original band, was called the Earwigs. And then he started him, Glenn Buxington on guitar, Dennis Dunaway on bass, and then later adding Michael Bruce and Neil Smith on drums. The band Alice Cooper. And the band Alice Cooper existed from the late 60s to about 73. They reached commercial success and then broke up in about 75. When Fernier would adopt the name as both his legal and stage name. And he would go on to just have a massive career. And Alice Cooper is one of those guys. That when you hear his songs, he's one of those when you hear his collection, you're like, oh yeah, oh yeah, that song too. <laughs> like you forget about how many hits he actually has. Stuff like School's Out and Feed My Frankenstein and I'm 18. And I will say this, I saw Alice Cooper in concert and this is 
in his later years. So this is in the 2000s. And it's probably still one of the best shows I've ever seen in my life. The way he ties his music to an entire like stage show with costume changes and everything and how he gets, how he involves everything. And like his daughter and a few other people are all involved in it. It is just incredible. It is just, it is definitely a show worth going to. And one of the few shows that I sat in the seats and enjoyed the whole way through. Definitely would uh, recommend. He's like 72 now. So I did not go- know too that his band name was Alice Cooper and then later changed his name to it. Yeah. That brings us to the song It's No Crime by Kenneth Babyface Edmonds. Yeah, guys. That babyface. Babyface? Babyface. This baby movie face. literally has everything. Bad English, Alice Cooper, Babyface, Sly, Byron Jones, Brian Jones, Robert Starr, Billy Blanks, like Bigfoot. <laughs> like this movie literally has everything. Yeah, yeah. And so Babyface, obviously a massive singer, songwriter, and record producer. He has written and produced 26 number one R&B hits. I mean, eat, Usher, eat your heart out. <laughs> <laughs> And he's won 12 Grammys and ranked number 20 on the top 50 greatest producers list. Guys, can you believe Babyface is 62 years old? That's it? Yeah. I actually would have thought he was old, way older than that. That means that, oh. like, literally the name holds true. Like, when he was making himself big in music, he was literally a baby. Yeah, he was a baby. Yeah. So that brings us to our last song of the night, Harlem Nocturnal by Dark Town Strutters. The song Harlem Nocturnal was originally written by Earl Hagen. We'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> Dark Town Strutters, the band, I could not find anything. I found a vague Facebook that might have something to do with them or not. The only <laughs> thing I could find for Dark Town Strutters is that there is a 1975 black exploitation movie called Dark Town Strutters that apparently has been referenced by Quentin Tarantino. Tarantino as some Mm. of his inspiration. Obviously, that has nothing to do with the song in the 80s movie, so I have no idea what happened to the band, if they are associated with that Facebook and are still touring. (laughs) If anyone knows, let me know. But (laughs) Earl Hagen was an American composer for movies and TV who came up with themes for stuff like The Dick Van Dyke Show Mm. and I Spy and The Mod Squad Show. He co-wrote and whistled the fishing hole melody <laughs> of the main theme for the Andy Griffith show. <laughs> I mean, he, I mean, I know it's a, it's a famous whistle, but <laughs> but it's still a whistle. <laughs> yes, yes. This song he wrote as an instrumental, as a tribute to Duke Ellington and Johnny Hodges, and it was used as a theme for TV's Mickey Spillane's Mike Hammer. <laughs> and eventually renamed the new Mike Hammer. Because eventually, we just got rid of Mikey, Mickey Spillaney and just made it the new Mike Hammer. So, so that's the origin of Harlem Nocturnal. But if you find out about Dark Town, Dark Town Strutters, and if they are in fact associated with the 1975 black exploitation movie, please let us know. <laughs> yes, email us. Go to gmail.com. Please tell us. Tell us. We need to know. (laughs) And that is your music, guys. I can't believe this movie. I know. I can't believe this movie. It has everything. Yeah, it really is everything. It's like a who's who of all the cliches (laughs) and action movies of that era, too. All right. Well, let's go give our final thoughts on this movie. Our first movie of season three. All right, Melissa, as the person who's probably seen this movie the most. And also paid attention the entire time and knows the story. (laughs) What is your final thoughts on this? Um, Well, I mean, this whole this whole theme was my idea, the unlikely duo, and it came from this movie. (laughs) It was born from Tango and Cash because Tango is button up and uptight, and he wears suspenders and little round glasses. Listen, we've learned, though, that if you're an action star, that as you age, your glasses get smaller. Well, they get smaller, yes, of course. <laughs> and then there's Cash. He's wild. He's got a giant mullet, and he wears tight pants, and, like, his pants c- kind of high up, though. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> well, they knew Swayze was originally thought, so they thought maybe they have to pull their pants up higher. <laughs> True story. <laughs> yeah, but, I mean, we've talked about it a bunch about this movie, the ending being phenomenal. The whole entire movie is a who's who of action 
like most people would call them like the B stars of movies, but they're not B stars to us. They are the stars, you know, having Robert Zadar be in this movie right off the bat in the very first scene is a great, it's a great sign for this movie. Also, like John said, it starts out with a chase scene <laughs> for no reason, a convertible, a chase scene, a man in suspenders with a tiny gun. What could get better? And it does. It just continues to get better. I have no complaints about this movie, and I think it's the perfect movie to set off this season of the podcast because we're going to have some really great ones that go way off the path. <laughs> <laughs> so we got to start with a classic. This is a classic. You know, most I agree. This movie is so fun, and that's why I continue to come back to it. Yeah, okay, maybe it is a parody of other 80s action movies, but if that's the case, then basically every movie Sylvester Stallone's made since then has been a parody about himself. Right. I mean, yeah. Right. <laughs> it's just so much fun. And it's got it's so deep, so much going on. Stories are disconnected, but it's okay because everything's just so much fun. You're so excited to see whatever's going to come next. Like there's chase scenes, and then cops going to j- this jail scene, and then also like the big prison breakout, and then it's got everything. This movie literally has everything, and that's why it's got so many people in it too. It perfectly encapsulates what it is to love action movies from the 80s. And we talk about this all the time. Modern action movies often go astray because they're boring. The stories are cookie cutter. But what they always miss is that there's got to be something that's different. Some reason why your movie is different. And it can't just be like, he grew up in Hong Kong. Like, that can't be your well, your your twist. But you got to go to Silly Town in order for it to be interesting. That way you do something new. That doesn't always necessarily mean it has to connect to the story. It's just got to be in Silly Town. Put a giant scope on the gun. Why not? <laughs> Like put a boot, <laughs> put a gun in your boot. <laughs> when they leave, trying to sneak out of the club, make the main character dress up as a woman. Like let's just go to Silly Town. Let's do it. Let's just go there. That's what makes them yeah. more interesting. We get away from this cookie cutter stuff. And I love Scott Adkins. And but that's the type of movie that I'm talking about. Is that it's just it, everything's by the numbers, and that's what makes this movie great. When we do go by the numbers, it's so over the top, and then we go astray from it sometimes, and that's what makes it so much fun. John. What are your final thoughts? That was going to be my point is that it's always more fun when it's over the top. And I'm a big comic book fan. And that's a big thing with comic books. When you read comic books is everything's to the max and everything's extreme and everything's over the top. And that's what I love about these action movies is everything is big explosions and over the top action. That's what I really love about this movie. No apologies. We're just going to put the pedal to the metal and we're just going to blow stuff up and fun action. And then, like you said, uh, the in between, we're going to go to Silly Town. We're going to have fun with it. We're not going to take ourselves too seriously because we know that it's just a bunch of action and we're just going to get there. Absolutely love it. This has always been one of my all time favorites. And then learning about Jack Palance, learning about Vladimir Palanuk, the <laughs> most interesting man in the world. And I swear, almost need to do a movie about that guy's life like that's incredible from the mines of like west virginia to playing football to boxing heavyweights to flying a bomber to writing for the chronicle and oh man and that's gonna do it for us this week on go with the heat we hope you enjoyed this episode we would love to hear from you email us go with the heat at gmail.com get us on facebook get us on twitter get us on instagram you can go to that website, go with the heat.com. You can find all the ways to contact us. You can also go there and see all the ways you can give us money. It's super and- easy. You can go there and find all kinds of ways to give us money. If you didn't listen to our preseason kickoff, we're going to be using that money to make this podcast a little bit more accessible to people. Uh, in particular, people who are hard of hearing or deaf. That way we can make sure we make very good captions and subtitles and transcripts that go along with the show. So I encourage you to go back and give that a listen. There are chapters now in this podcast. You know that? There's chapters in this podcast. You can open up your podcast player, swipe direction. I don't know what it is in your app. I don't have all the apps on my phone. (laughs) Any extra funds will be used to start a campaign to find out when Demolition Man 2 is coming out. Damn it. We're going to get to the bottom of this, guys. You're going to write a letter to Sylvester? <laughs> Be sure to check out that website, goingtheheat.com. Like I said, if you would love to hear from you, let us know what you think about this movie. Let us know what you think about this theme. Let us know what you think about action stars' glasses getting smaller as they age. Do their eyes get smaller? Their head shrink? <laughs> like, what happens? How come they got the smaller glasses? <laughs> if you would like to help support us and you don't have any money, we understand things are tight. It's been a tough year and a half. 
or so, just share the show with a friend or go leave us a review. Go to or your podcast. Or send us gold. We'll also take <laughs> stones, some old jewelry, teeth, anything you have. <laughs> Your gold teeth that fell out, we'll take those. We don't care. We're not picky. The silver caps, we like those too. That's fine. Does your car have a catalytic converter? Those things are valuable. Just mail the whole car. Go to your podcast, your platform of choice, and leave us a review. Now, don't write a note about the show. No one ever actually reads the reviews. So in there, instead of writing a review about the show, just give us five stars. Nothing less than five stars. If you go, if you go in and leave us a review that's not five stars, mean you've got a serious fucking problem. <laughs> leave us a five star review, and then in that note, write instead what you think Tango and Cash Two would be about, especially if it was made in like 2015 when they're both like in their 60s. Like, what would Tango and Cash Two be? Write that in your review. That's gonna do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode, and we'll see y'all next time. Bye, pals.